Hello, and welcome to a very special briefcase that is part of a series I'm leading on diversity, equity, and inclusivity with CME Outfitters. Today's CME briefcase is entitled Mental Health Care, Real World Tactics to Address Health Inequities. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from Johnson & Johnson. I'm Dr. Monica Peek, and I'm the Ellen H. Block Professor of Health Justice in the Department of Medicine at the University of Chicago. There, I'm also the Associate Director of the Chicago Center of Diabetes Translation Research and the Director of Research at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, all in Chicago, Illinois. I'm really delighted to be joined today by my distinguished colleagues, Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt and Dr. Javid Sukara. Dr. Oliver Pyatt and Dr. Sukara, would you mind introducing yourselves to the audience? Sure. Hello. I'm Dr. Wendy Oliver Pyatt, and I'm the CEO of Galen Mental Health, um, where we have a couple of programs that really use a psychosocial model for treatment of severe mental illness. Those are BrightQuest and the Galen Hope Program. I'm also a fellow of the Academy for Eating Disorders and the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. I'm a former a member of the Joint Commission Advisory Committee for JCO. And I uh, did my training at NYU Bellevue out of a love for treatment of severe mental illness and community psychiatry. Thank you so much for being here. And hello to, to both of you and to everybody else who's joining. My name is Javid Sakara. I am the chair and chief of psychiatry at Hartford Hospital and the Institute of Living in Hartford, Connecticut. My background is as an MD, PhD, including being a practicing child and adolescent psychiatrist and having a PhD in health professions education, where a good degree of my research is focused on addressing different forms of stigma and bias through education for health professionals. Uh, in addition to these roles, I'm an associate clinical professor of psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine, and I'm on the editorial advisory board of the Canadian Medical Association Journal and deputy editor of the journal Perspectives on Medical Education. Thank you. So now you all can see how and why I'm so excited to have you both here today. Just a wealth of experience treating underserved populations, a range of clinical um, illnesses, experience with um, academics, professional education. So we have just all here today with us. And so thank you all for joining us. I'm gonna start with our learning objective for today. And we have two. The first is to identify the impact of inequities on mental health. And second, to individualize a holistic treatment plan for mental health care to improve patient outcomes. Before we start, I do wanna remind our audience that this CMEO briefcase is a continuation of our initiative to address unconscious bias, health disparities, and racial inequities. We're building a comprehensive library of educational activities addressing these very important issues. And today's activity is a, continues, is a continuation of the discussion specifically in mental health. On this slide are just some of the titles of the activities in the series with links to each of them. To view any of these programs simply, click on the activity title in the slides. If you want to participate in at least three of the programs in our DNI Hub, you will also be eligible to receive a digital badge demonstrating your commitment to education on diversity, equity, and inclusivity. Before we dive in, let me start by asking our audience a question, and you can go ahead and start voting now. How often do you consider social determinants of health when developing a treatment plan for patients with mental health conditions? Answer what you do right now, and please be candid with your responses. Okay, and so we'll have one more audience uh, response question and you can go ahead and start voting. This question is how familiar are you with mental health care inequities that contribute to the disparities in patient outcomes that we see? All right, so let's start our discussion by introducing our case today. Wendy, can you tell us about Dante? So the case is uh, regarding Dante. He's a 28-year-old Black male referred to the local community behavioral health center for psychiatric evaluation after presenting to the emergency department the previous night, showing signs and symptoms of paranoia, delusions, and panic. His chief complaint were, was that he had fears that his roommate was trying to poison him. His past medical history, as reported in the emergency department, by his mother is that he had briefly seen a, a child psychi psychologist as a teenager. And then he was seen by a psychiatrist in college. Interestingly, he did have a maternal aunt institutionalized for many years at a state psychiatric facility. The mother did not really provide additional details and left the intake form blank and urged 
Dante to pray for help. So that's a real sign of of really a social determinant of health of, of how a psychosocial variable may impact the way a family may view mental illness or a, the treatment of mental illness. So the patient statements included, I can't sleep. Um, that's when they know, you know, I'm the weakest. I'm not taking any pills. They make me gain weight and I always lose them. And also, I just want to keep a job and pay my bills, but everyone keeps messing with me. Javid, would you like to give us more on the history of Dante's case? Yeah, so to continue on this thread, I think if we take this cross-sectional moment in time for Dante and spread it out to understand his experiences, when he saw a child and adolescent psychologist at 16, he was referred originally by a school counselor for seeing things that other people can't see or hearing God call his name. Uh, he's admitted to using cannabis since experiencing some abuse from his uncle about one year prior. And he had uh, noted in his record that his mother lacked alarm regarding both his condition and the abuse that was being alleged, stating that the drugs were planting stories in his head and that God would only heal him if he would quit the drugs. There is clear evidence of a lack of trust in mental health professionals from both patient and mothers and, and the mother, but at the end of the day, he was deemed not a risk to himself, and he was discharged after one session, citing the inability to pay. Then again, when he was 23, he intersected with an adult psychiatrist, where he was referred by student health services due to angry outbursts and poor academic performance. His complaints included things like frequent insomnia, feeling like there were voices on the TV sending him messages or warnings, and some paranoia around his roommate maybe poisoning him. He stated at the time when he was 23 that God spoke to him, telling him what to do to keep himself safe. There was documentation of potential disorganized speech, repeated themes of distress, and a lack of insight regarding what was perceived as a peculiar sense of experiences. By the time he was 23, he had been diagnosed primarily with schizophrenia, paranoid type, but secondary diagnoses included uh, non-organic insomnia and cannabis use disorder. He was prescribed at that time quetiapine 300 milligrams, and whether or not he was taking it was really unclear. So this is a fascinating case, um, and a core issue that providers really should consider in patients who have mental health conditions are the social determinants of health. And so how do you see some of these um, impacting Dante's case and similar patients like him in your practice? Um, so Javid, I'll, I'll let you take this first question. So it's important to remember that beyond just social determinants, there's structural determinants. And one of the most prominent ones to consider in this case is racism and the role that uh, racism, particularly uh, different forms of anti-Black racism, might play in his history, experiences, and the need for the provider to really address this as part of their interaction. We know that there's no one size fits all, that we need to individuate our approach to each and every patient. But we also know that there are often cultural differences uh, and things like help seeking and how people deal with and process distress. What's normative for one may not be the same for the other. To add to that, there's an intersectional risk when people have intersecting forms of discrimination um, that might be gendered. If someone's experienced gender-based violence or trauma, it might be related to being indigenous or the effects of colonial harms. There may be other forms of minority stress or trauma. Someone might be a veteran. Someone might experience discrimination. So what that leads us to is blind spots that affect our assessment, things like diagnostic racism, how we interpret what might be schizophrenia in one context versus um, something more uh, stress-related in another. It influences how we perceive things like drug use and the criminalization uh, of things um, that relate to race and gender. We also know that Black patients are more likely to receive treatments in emergency departments and more likely to be misdiagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia often when they're describing normative experiences of racial trauma and distress. We also know structurally that they're more vulnerable to being uninsured, as we saw in Dante's case. So briefly, what we need to remember is that we as providers, as, as professionals, to see each individual as a unique, nuanced case, collect a detailed history, and make sure that we check and recheck our assumptions. We have to be aware of our blind spots and biases on things like cannabis use, labeling, stereotyping, uh, and normative experiences that we might perceive as peculiar. 
And most importantly, we need to be sensitized to fear and mistrust in the health system at large and in the mental health system, where that degree of fear and mistrust might be compounded and create interactions with patients and their caregivers that allow for shared decision-making and feedback seeking. Thank you. That was a whole lot <laughs> um, to help us unpack that case and really sort of understand the patient and family's perspective and how they may be experiencing that um, and how we as providers may be able to see that a little differently. There's a saying in the Black community that just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean somebody's not out to get me um, because there's so much um, trauma and targeting of African-Americans um, by the state. We see a lot of state-sanctioned um, violence against Black men. Um, and so there is the reality of you know racism and then that could be layered on top of, you know, mental health disorders and may be exacerbating mental health disorders. And so sort of um, for people who may not be having that lived experience where someone really is out to get you, when someone comes and presents with these symptoms, you know, um, how you make a diagnosis really needs to be um, more carefully thought out. So thank you for that. <laughs> Um, so Wendy, I'm going to turn to you and talk about the six levels of validation, um, because the first critical step in providing more equitable and holistic care is listening, um, yeah. really hearing our patients and validating their experiences and their feelings. And so there's a tool that we can use. Um, and can you tell us about this tool? Absolutely. And these, these six levels of validation can be applicable in all sorts of settings. But I think that what we were just talking about also points to the fact that in in really considering social determinants of health, we need to take a little bit more time. And sometimes our treatment program uh, protocols need to be a little bit more comprehensive. And we, we may have to take a, a longer period of time and really commit to building the relationship and the trust that's needed. And then making sure also that psychosocial supports are available to individuals and not just brush off um, the struggles and the limitations and the social support that a person may be um, a, a very big part of how the, the condition can continue. So it really is about taking time, stopping and listening. And so getting into the six levels of validation, which I really love, and, and it's nice to just read about it and even practice this. And again, it's, it's applicable in so many um, situations. So step one is really the very minimal that we can do, which is active listening. And that expresses to the patient that you are at the very minimum you're interested and you're alert to their concerns. Um, one of the things in this situation is to minimize nonverbal behaviors, like let's not be looking at our cell phones, for example, um, not be looking away, not be fidgeting, really having good eye contact, appearing awake and alert, and, and really like deeply listening, just expressing that in our in our demeanor toward the patient. Um, and that right there can really help help the patient calm down and feel safer and more comfortable uh, right out of the gate. And then step two is accurate reflection. It's important to not just parrot or echo back verbatim what the patient has expressed. This is allowing the clinician to insert some opinions while reflecting on the patient's statement to enhance clarity in the conversation um, by, by adding in some opinions as the person, as you're reflecting, it really demonstrates to the patient that you've actually thought about what they said and you actually have concerns or it created a, a sort of reaction within you. So it accurate reflection also indicates and says to the patient, I care. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, a patient may say, I don't like it when providers don't listen to me. And this could be something that very real that they've experienced. And the healthcare provider um, could reflect back by saying, it seems to me that you've may have had some providers in the past who didn't really listen to you and have made, may have ignored your concerns. Is this correct? And would you like to share more about your experience? Mm -hmm. That's that sounds up. really like a difficult thing that you may have experienced or, you know. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's very real. And especially in certain populations where symptoms tend to be more, more minimized or uh, sort of overlooked um, cert with certain populations. Okay. And then step three um, is articulating nonverbals. And so this sort of says, you know, has the healthcare provider considered the patient experience as if they were 
the patient themselves. So that's really the word that I like to use to help me, you know, reinforce this idea is empathic attunement. So having a sense of empathy toward the patient for the patient's circumstances. At this step, the provider sort of imagines. So I like to use creatively imagines what mm -hmm. it's like to be the patient. Um, not just imagine if they themselves were experiencing what the patient is experiencing, but rather considers based on previous com communication with the patient, their perspective and how they personally are functioning in that situation. So imagining as a black male, a sense of fear, which some might call paranoia, but it, that sense of fear is very real and based on some very real things, perhaps that that person has experienced and having empathy for that. The clinician can't just put themselves in the patient th shoes, but rather they want to imagine that they are the patient, imagine creatively, experientially from the client's perspective. And this directly ties into step four. And this, this requires some creativity and some thought and some time, but this is really where you go from just getting a history to really doing something meaningful and therapeutic for the patient and for the relationship that you're developing with the patient, which will pay at pay in um, of drugs when you're trying to implement a treatment plan. Now you're building a relationship. Step four involves recognizing historical content. This is validating the client based on history. Now that we've considered their perspective and considered their history, we can verbalize what we have imagined and inferred from the patient, what the patient may be experiencing. This is an even higher level of reflection on the total experience of the patient. And drawing from the previous example, the clinician could say something like, I can imagine how difficult, difficult it is to open up about your condition and feel like a provider isn't even listening or appears bossy. I would like to avoid making those mistakes. And I want you to know, I want, I want to do what I can do to show you I'm hearing you so that I won't irritate you and appear bossy like other providers. Interestingly here in this example, the provider here has made the assumption based on attempting to see from the client's perspective that they feel like providers came off as bossy. However, the provider in this scenario may have accidentally projected some of their own experiences into the scenario, and the patient may, be respond, may, may respond by saying, I never said I felt like other <laughs> providers were bossy. I just said that I hate that they don't listen to me. Mm -hmm. The provider can address the client's concerns, and it really just opens up further dialogue. <laughs> Um, and, and that, but by saying, you know, this thing about bossy, it's showing you're really thinking and trying to have empathy. Um, the person could be upset by you inferring, um, something like that, I'll say. So I'm not necessarily recommending inferring or, or actively projecting your own thoughts about it. Um, but really just staying open to the patient's reactions to it and not being defensive about whatever that may bring up for the patient. Um, I think one of the most important things is to normalize emotional content. <clears throat> so I, I call in DBT, we call it validating the valid. So validating client based on current circumstances and stating, I'm sorry, I inaccurately assume that you may have had the experience of that other providers were being bossy. I have a really fun quote from Mr. Rogers in the world, his book called the world according to Mr. Rogers. And it has to do with validation. And that, that quote of Mr. Rogers says, there's no should or should not when it comes to having feelings. They're a part of who we are and their origin is beyond our control. Once we can come to terms with that, we may find it easier to deal with those feelings. So this normalizing the emotional content context is very, very important because the feelings that we all have in a variety of situations, when we really reach in and have empathy for what they're experiencing, they, the emotion, the emotional content they're experiencing, it will make sense in one way, shape or form. If we don't understand why a person's feeling a certain way, we're probably judging them versus um, engaging in empathic attunement. So we have to watch out when we don't understand, we tend to lean into judgment and judgment just is a divisive kind of um, experience between the patient and the provider. Um, the more curious or compassionately curious we can be, the more likely we're going to actually understand. And the more we understand, the more attuned we are, the more attuned we are, the safer the patient's going to feel and the more likely the treatment plan is going to be adhered to. 
Step six has to do with radical genuineness, genuineness. And this can expand on level five by having the provider communicate to the patient really as an equal and discuss similarities and shared experience. Now, this is something you have to be careful with because you don't want to overshare and you certainly don't want the patient to start feeling like they need to take care of you. So that's, that's important. Um, but the healthcare provider can be authentic and treat that person like an equal and just engage in a conversation by saying, I made the assumption about feeling like providers were being bossy because that's how I have felt when I had providers who didn't validate or acknowledge my concerns when formulating a treatment plan for me. So that's just being real with a person. That's the radical genuineness. I think in, in healthcare, a lot of times doctors and providers are sort of taught to be very hierarchical. And in that we forget that we can just be real with pe people. And I always like to see, say that I'm first, I'm first Wendy or I'm first Dr. Oliver Pyatt. So I'm a human, it's a human to human relationship. And it's certainly guided by my role in the person's life. But first and foremost, I'm relating to the other person, one human to another. And that's a very sacred opportunity for healing. Yes, I think patients really respond to that. Um, they know that we've been to school. They know that we have all of this information and yeah. treatment tools, you know, at our ready. What they may not know is that we have the emotional empathy um, and that we're ready to serve them in a holistic way. What they may not know is that we see them as human beings, not just as a myriad of diseases to be fixed. And so when we sort of lean into that first, I think that helps to create a safer space and open up all these potential um, opportunities for creating this therapeutic alliance. And so thank you. Thank you both. You both are just fabulous, um, as I knew you would be, um, in sharing and helping me learn more and hopefully the audience too. So um, just excellent stuff. We're going to transition now to what we more typically think about as healthcare professionals, and that is more specific treatment. Mm -hmm. So we're going to um, talk about treatment options for Dante. And so let me start by with an, uh, asking our audience a question, and you can start voting. <laughs> we have so many audience uh, questions. So the question is, given Dante's aversion to pills, which of the following is an evidence-based option for managing his symptoms of schizophrenia? All right, Javid. So in patients like Dante who struggle with adherence to medications, long acting agents may be an option. Can you talk about the efficacy data that we, that exists for long acting in injectables and what's your experience been like with these agents in your practice? Absolutely. So we know definitely that there's a considerable amount of evidence that there are advantages that long acting injectables have. They tend to have higher efficacy and they tend to improve and increase compliance, uh, particularly when we're dealing with challenges around compliance that can often relate not only to mistrust, but also tolerability, side effects, um, and just the system and structure of support that sometimes patients need. That stated, we also know that they can still have a risk of side effects, things like extrapyramidal symptoms or uh, prolactin-related symptoms. At the end of the day, any injectable form of medication is going to have a different layer of stigma and mistrust associated with it. For anyone who might experience mistrust or um, judgment or a, a lack of transparency in their experiences, the idea of being injected by something um, is going to be treated you know, psychologically very differently than, for example, taking a pill that has its own connotations. We also know from the data that uh, white patients are actually less likely to receive injectables than black patients. And I think information like this really helps us to challenge some of our critical assumptions around how we engage in conversations about compliance, tolerance, and side effects. What this allows us to do is really individuate care. So if Dante is someone who we think might be a candidate, recognize all the different structural determinants that influence the conversation we might have. Really think about sheer decision-making, um, seeing and building trust, ensuring that that trust may take time, but partnering with patients like Dante and their caregivers to ensure that they have informed and transparent consent about any form of a long acting injectable or medication for that matter. Partners and caregivers are an essential component of that. And we're not always taught to think of family-centered 
care. Sometimes we can be very individualistic. So that's another important consideration, particularly for people who are emerging adults with schizophrenia or severe forms of mental illness for whom there's a great degree of caregiver burden. Um, and the caregiver mistrust is something we need to tune into just as much as patient mistrust. And what we're trying to do really is humanize care, right? So that's the way to approach the conversation about an LAI. Yes, absolutely. And as you were mentioning, emerging adults, many of the mental health disorders sort of um, manifest in emerging adults. Um, and so it's that critical time where people are becoming more independent, but um, that's when many of these uh, diseases sort of begin uh, presenting themselves. So we have set um, we've uh, ourselves up with lots of these conversations already for our next slide, which we don't fully have time to unpack, but luckily we've already begun the unpacking process for many of them. Um, and that's to discuss a detailed management plan about how we would sort of think about these three different buckets of culture and spirituality, shared decisions and holistic care. And we've touched on actually each of these um, and all of these help us to, uh, to define and create comprehensive care plans that like we said, um, address patients as fully human, um, and think about their multiple social identities, their intersecting identities, how they may manifest in their culture, in their faith, in their family and support networks, and how we need to share in the decision-making process with them and their families, how we need to um, really engage and create safe spaces, all of that work. Um, is really to create a safe space where people trust us um, and feel like they can um, be open and honest about their vulnerabilities, um, their concerns, their lived experience, so that we can come up with a treatment plan that they feel is good for them that they feel safe and confident about, that they're going to adhere to, <laughs> to the best of their ability. Um, and so, you know, it takes a village for anything. And what we're trying to do is build that village with all of the, the skills and tools and people on the healthcare team and people in that person's life. And so um, thank you all for sort of setting up all the building blocks um, for these core components that um, are really critical uh, to dealing with patients who have mental health uh, disorders. So Wendy, we're gonna um, go back to the case um, and I'll let you pick back up. Uh, Dante's provider does in fact utilize a shared decision-making model to initiate a holistic treatment plan with Dante, hooray. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about his treatment plan and how do you develop these types of plans in your practice? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll just start by saying, I think that we talked a little bit about judgment and compassion and stereotyping. And I think that's an important point to discuss. I think also it's very interesting um, that black individuals are more likely to get injectables versus white individuals. So that's something that we can all just be very curious about, I think. Um, one of the things that we also wanna think about when we're developing treatment plans is going back to this judgment piece, because some of our patients who have struggled and had a difficult time getting into a healed place um, do have resistance to treatment. And you pointed out that you know many of these individuals are young adults. And it the issue is that there's a part of them as they're evolving that's striving so hard to, for that independence. They have a natural desire to become more and more independent. We all have that. And that the drive and desire to become more in, independent, um, it ran, runs right into that wall um, of being mentally ill. And so instead of thinking of a patient as being treatment resistant um, or using language maybe that could be a little bit judgmental, I'll say. Um, I think thinking of it uh, on the along the lines of this person has a strong drive for independence. This person sort of doesn't want to feel that they need medication. And that's not really something, that's not a moral issue. That's not that this is a bad person. It's that that person has a strong drive for independence. So we want to sort of take take that view, I think, and see it through a positive lens and use that as we're developing the treatment plan that we're talking about how we can help you become more and more um, independent and really think about the things that the patient's wanting and how to help them get there. So um, 
For Dante, he received education and counseling through this process of shared decision making, not like I'm going to do this to you, sort of like, let's talk about the options here and like figure out what sounds like it's going to work um, in your favor the best so that you can have these things that you're really wanting in your life. So lifestyle interventions, just briefly, I'll mention that, um, you know, that sense of belonging and connection is very, very important. And individuals who may have severe mental illnesses may become more and more um, isolated. So um, through comprehensive treatment planning and programs that have psychosocial components to them, we can help patients build small communities and ways to have activities with other peers, which is a huge component of the person healing, just feeling like they belong and that they have connections um, to combat the isolation that can go on with uh, mental illnesses is, is is just gigantic. I mean, it's not about coming to an office and somebody gives you a prescription and a nurse gives you an injection and then you go home alone. That is going to be ineffective. Um, so we talked already about the long acting injectables versus the oral antipsychotics and really having a conversation about the risks and the benefits of either. And, you know, helping a person see that by taking daily medication oral, I mean, how many of us remember to take their medication on every single day and help them see the likelihood of rehospitalization may be different depending on their, um, their choice of medication. Again, we talked about lifestyle, but also community resources, helping the person have some kind of routine, maybe do a volunteer activity if they're not ready to go back for, to school or taking one very simple class versus a full caseload and sort of balancing those challenges, finding the doable edge for the patient so they're challenged, but they're not flooded. Um, in Dante's case, because of the shared decision making and through that process, he agreed to initiate the long acting um, injectable therapy with regular follow up and monitoring at the Community Behavioral Health Center. Um, what I think is really important is that he was provided uh, he was provided a referral to work with a therapist specializing in trauma therapy. So we recall from the history that he had experienced trauma, but that had been very minimalized and brushed off minimize and brush off, which was really, really sad. So our act of providing that trauma therapy really showed his, his emotions matter, his response to what had happened um, and the pain he was experiencing um, was really important to take very seriously. So that, that trauma therapist shows him like, we take you seriously and we're here mm -hmm. to really, um, meet your needs. He was also connected with the benefit specialist, social services liaison and community support group um, through his lo local church. So all of the things that in his presentation we heard were important to him and his family that frequently just go completely unaddressed. Um, like, oh my gosh, like we don't have the skills and tools to, to really sort of think about those things. We're going to focus on the medication. Yeah. I really, I think that's just a wonderful a summary of how we can think more broadly about addressing the holistic care, you know, a holistic approach for the full human. And I really like how, you know, thinking about his life context, maybe we can like cut down on your classes. Like yeah. how can we help you be the most successful in life um, so that you're not feeling overwhelmed and having setbacks and really partnering um, in all aspects and thinking about all of the things that might trip you up. Um, and so that is, is just great. And, you know, I'm actually someone who thinks about diabetes a lot. And so for, oh, me, yeah. uh, for uh, young individuals who have type one diabetes, it is very similar, this sort of this phase of life that they go through, especially as they head off to college of, um, you know, leaving home and, you know, trying to be adherent to their care, but yet they're going to parties and their sugars are getting all wild. Yeah. And so having to sort of think about the, the holistic experience of their life and how to integrate the two. Um, so I really appreciate um, that last slide. Every every slide that you guys cover, everything <laughs> that you guys are talking about, it's like, yes, yes. It's yes. just interesting how these natural drives that, that, you know, the teenager with diabetes or young adult wanting to become more independent from their family and certainly not need a psychiatrist that just sort of collides with the illnesses that they are experiencing. And that's a really tough thing. I, I will also say, I think one of the things that's really a problem in our, in our, in our mental health system is that our care for people with severe mental illnesses through um, 
is really bifurcated. So we have some people who have Medicare and Social Security, and they have a tendency to just have um, recurrent hospitalizations. Um, there's really not strong psychosocial systems set up, except for in some situations, or people who have a lot of wealth who can pay for um, programs that provide that psychosocial um, support. And what we are really lacking is commercial insurers really paying for the types of programs that are so impactful for people with severe mental illness, where we can really do the psychosocial treatment, where we can implement things like PACT programs, assertive community treatment. Um, commercial insurance has really been um, falling short of providing that care. And it's really traumatizing to the patient and the entire family. So it's sort of like if you have tremendous wealth, you can go to these programs. And in some states and some cities, you do have some models of care that have psychosocial support. But for the person in between who you know works at American Airlines, who's kid develops um, a severe mental illness, the commercial insurance tends to have very limited support um, for psychosocial interventions. And that's a, a big area of uh, passion for me that I think is very important um, to begin to address, especially when we're thinking about social determinants of health. And mental health um, inequities. Yes. And yes. Our, um, the We have so many disparities in these sort of pockets of care that uh, typically don't fall under regular sort of what we consider to be medical care, mental right. health care, vision care, um, things that are critically important, um, but have, um, that are just wildly underfunded um, and are so important to the health and well being of um, all of our patients, particularly those who are marginalized. And so I, hear you. Um, and you know, the, the sad thing too, is that we're, we pay for it too. Fine. Even if it wasn't just a moral issue of caring for human beings in a humanizing way, we, we also pay for it within our society with recurrent hospitalizations, homelessness, individuals with severe mental illness and ending up in um, the prison system and incarcerated. So we're paying for it in all these different ways by not doing this very basic humanistic care. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we we could go on tangents for hours, but we're going to try and um, stay on. I'll stop. <laughs> on task. Yeah, it's so wonderful having these conversations with the both of you. We're going to have another audience response question, um, and this is a repeat. So now after our session today, I want to re-ask you all um, how um, in the future, how often will you consider social determinants of health when developing a treatment plan for your patients with mental health conditions? I want you to be honest, but I'm hoping that you've moved forward just a little bit. I just want to say what a wonderful discussion this was, just extraordinary. And I feel like we've obtained some great clinical pearls and examples that we can just put into practice right now. Um, very relevant clinical experience um, that we can use to provide more culturally competent care to ensure that we can enhance our diagnostic acumen, how we can improve our communication, how we can develop a tighter and better and more safe a therapeutic alliance with our patients, how we can optimize the treatment of our marginalized patients who have mental health disorders, just how we can do better. Let me summarize our discussion with some SMART goals, and SMART stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Timely. And that's what I hope that we can take from our presentation today and apply to uh, our practice. The first is to recognize that racial and ethnic disparities and inequities in mental health care exist, both in access and in quality. Um, two, to assess and validate the patient experience using a trauma-informed approach to psychiatric assessment. Third, to consider cultural, spiritual, and social determinants of health factors when crafting mental health treatment plans. Next, use a non-coercive and patient-centered language when um, communicating with patients to minimize the stigma and foster trust between the patient and healthcare providers. And last, implement evidence-based treatment using shared decision-making with patients to optimize their mental health outcomes. So here are just some of the topics that we've covered so far, and we'll be adding new content every month. We always want to hear from you about what more we could be doing. See me, um, CME Outfitters also has a diversity and inclusion hub with a number of excellent resources to share with your peers and your patients. 
To receive credit for today's activity, please complete the post-test and the evaluation online. You can then download your certificate immediately, right away. So thank you again, Wendy and Javid, for joining me today. I really cannot express how much I appreciate all of your insight, your wisdom, uh, your comments. Um, and thank you to the audience for joining us. Uh, so I'll just give a pause for any uh, final comments uh, for Wendy and Javid that you have. Yeah, I think that these cases can be very complex, right? They can be challenging. People that work in various settings can feel overwhelmed. But at the end of the day, it really is about coming back to the basic set of uh, both human level interactions and analytic and diagnostic skills. Gathering data, reflecting, critically reflecting, looking for patterns, engaging, testing hypotheses, but really uh, seeing and connecting to people at a human level. It's that one moment of connection that can really address a lifetime of mistrust. And we should never underestimate the power that we have working in the system to be able to help transform a young person's trajectory. Absolutely. Thank you. Wendy. I think that was so beautifully said. I think we should we should end with that. But that that one moment in time and that that is such just a beautiful way of putting it. And I think in a way, we we have to remember um, how powerful we can be through the experience of, of simply um, starting from a place of empathy. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Everyone, please be safe. They could uh, take good care of yourselves so that you can provide the best care for your patients and particularly our patients that are medically underserved and marginalized. Thank you so much and have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>